nice and succinct introduction since I'm so young, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so first of all, thanks to the colloquium organizers and to Michael, Colin, et cetera, for giving me this opportunity, and thanks to everyone else for actually coming. Um, so I, I promise I won't get too philosophical, but I want to start with a question that I think is good to have on the mind, since the bulk of this talk will be about very precision measurement of the kinematics and chemistry and, and detailed parameters about stars within our galaxy, to think about this question, why are we studying the Milky Way in detail at all? And so just to give you some, some numbers um, and characters, by 2022, roughly, thanks to Gaia and a number of other spe large spectroscopic and, and photometric surveys, we're going to have detailed measurements of full space position velocity today chemistry, so metallicity, bulk other chemical abundances, and stellar ages for about a billion stars in the galaxy. And it's good to ask and remember this question. There's a lot of good answers to that question. So you could be interested in star formation, the ISM, stellar structure, et cetera. For most of this talk, I'm going to focus on just one, which is the study of dark matter and what we can learn about dark matter from studying the pre precise kinematics of stars in our galaxy. So the hope. Uh, is that we can use the Milky Way as a laboratory to study dark matter and um, to study both the global structure of our own dark matter distribution and also small scale properties. And I think that's where all the action is really and where the Milky Way can, can deliver. So for example, here are two um, redshift zero, a, a power spectrum and a halo mass function for different dark matter models. So this is cold dark matter in both panels and then warm dark matter, different warm dark matter models with different temperatures, fuzzy dark matter, hoping Jerry would be here, but he's not. Um, anyway, we know things exist in this mass range and above because we see galaxies. We see satellites of those galaxies. We see dwarf galaxies and stars that have formed within uh, halos of those masses. I think the, the really interesting end where all the exciting stuff uh, to come is, is down at, at the low mass end in, in both, both cases. So for example, the existence of dark substructure in this mass range, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, would already put very strong constraints on how warm dark matter could be and would place constraints on how fuzzy dark matter could be. So, uh, and later on I'll show you some exciting new results that are going towards that goal. So, um, right, so the idea is we want to do some, a, a massive data compression, take a billion measurements of these quantities and measure something about the mass density of the Milky Way. And, and from that mass density we hope to learn something about the dark matter. Um, I'm not going to talk about what we can do with the abundances and the ages and the stellar labels. I'm going to focus just on this problem. If you had good kinematics for a large number of stars, how do we learn about the mass density? Uh, and by the way, there's actually no real good methods to combine this kinematic, I kinematic information with the chemical information to do this inference. So that's basically why I'm skipping over it. And motivated by a quote from the Holy Bible of galactic dynamics, I'm going to make one more assumption that basically everybody makes, which is, and the, the general idea is since the galaxy is about 10 giga years old and most of the orbits in the inner galaxy, inner halo and disk, are, have orbital periods of about half a giga year or, or less, most of the stars have completed tens of revolutions and so we can assume the galaxy is in equilibrium and steady state. So if you make that assumption, we can drop the T, we just have to learn the mass density, and of course, we don't actually ever measure that mass density. The best we can hope for is to measure something like the acceleration or the force field. And then, of course, Poisson tells us from that we can get at the underlying mass density. So then the question arises, how do we actually measure A, the acceleration field or the force field, given that we only have a single kinematic snapshot of our galaxy? And there's no necessary relationship between the positions and velocities of stars and the force field. We could just be observing all of the, the stars when they happen to all come together into something that looks like a galaxy. And that would tell us absolutely nothing about all of, all of the questions that we're interested in. So to phrase it in, in the context of something like the solar system, if I gave you the positions and velocities of all of the planets today, or right now, could you tell me the force law? Like, could you solve for Newtonian gravity? And it's a hard problem. And you can really only do it, that's the only animation in my talk, by the way, you can only do it if you make very strong assumptions. So for the solar system, for example, these are some of the assumptions you could make. It's long-lived. We're not observing it at a special time. It's non-resonant. It's non-chaotic. 
the orbits are phase mixed, um, the planets are bound, and maybe spherical symmetry as well. By the way, there's a great discussion of this, this exact problem in this paper by Joe Bovey and Ian Murray and David Hogg. So that's for the solar system, and all those assumptions I think seem pretty natural to most of us because we have a lot of other information about these, these planets. We, we can see their full orbits for most of them. For the, the galaxy, I think it might make you feel a little uncomfortable to make some of these same assumptions about the dynamical state of, of the Milky Way. Do we think it's long-lived? Is it non-resonant? Are we observing it at a, at a special time, et cetera? So, of course, yeah. That's right, yeah. I'm just unpacking some of the more detailed things. Um, and I'm being a little loose with terminology, but of course they all have very specific meanings. Uh, so, right, so we could use cosmological simulations to gain sort of intuition about all, whether we can make these assumptions for a galaxy like the Milky Way. But of course you don't want to extrapolate too far given the simulation since we want to learn essentially the input into how to, to do those simulations. So um, uh, back to the question, how do we measure this, this acceleration field from a snapshot uh, of the galaxy? There's been a huge literature on this and I have to gloss over many of the details, but there's basically two main categories of, of how to do this. Uh, one which I'm calling distribution function moment methods. So if you're familiar with the genes equations which relate the acceleration field to moments of the distribution function, which specifies the probability of observing a star at any given position in phase space, um, you, can, you can hope to predict those velocity moments at different locations in the galaxy and then try to measure them and use that to con constrain the acceleration. And as a, if you're doing that, you have to make a lot of de detailed assumptions that I won't go through. Uh, but the point is that many of those are just a subset of the things I listed on the previous slide. There's another set of methods which I'm calling orbit ensemble methods, which has a connection back to Princeton because of, of Schwarzschild. So this was, uh, the general idea is you have a, a guess for the form of the distribution function. You generate orbits, like a library of orbits from that distribution function, and then you try to reproduce the phase space density as a mixture of those orbits. But in order to make a library of orbits, you have to make uh, assumptions, both practical and predicated by physics, in order to actually even execute this. So why am I talking about all of this? So this basically covers most of the methods that we use to do this kind of inference. And one of the interesting challenges is that Gaia, early Gaia results have shown that these assumptions are very bad. And we can actually resolve the time dependence, the disequilibrium, the unmixed populations of stars in the galaxy. But duh, like we knew for a long time that those assumptions were wrong in detail. It's not necessarily that, that Gaia is showing us that they're wrong, it's showing us how wrong they are. And the point is that um, many of those methods deliver very precise measurements of quantities related to the acceleration field of, of the galaxy, which we then want to use to measure pro properties of dark matter. Uh, but if we know that the assumptions that go into these precise measurements are wrong, that's gonna make us take on some bias. And we want to overcome that bias in order to learn about the physics of dark matter. So uh, that was a long introduction, but this is basically the overview for the, the rest of the talk. So I'm gonna talk about Gaia, what it is, and, and show you a little bit of the internals and, and how the survey is done. Uh, I'll show a couple of the, the, what I think are the most exciting results that have come out of Gaia, DR2, data release two. So that's just in the last five months or so. And then I'll, I'll talk about some things we've been doing recently, also heavily using the Gaia data. Um, that, that may suggest that we're actually seeing perturbations from dark matter substructure on stellar, a particular stellar stream around the Milky Way. So Gaia, um, two, two disclaimers to start with. One is, it's no longer an acronym, so I still see it on everyone's slides in all caps, and that, that's wrong now, because the I was interferometer, and there's no interferometer on the actual spacecraft that flew. So it's, it's, it's like this, it's title case. The second is that I have no affiliation with the Gaia consortium. So if you, want any, if you want to ask detailed engineering questions, you can't talk to me. You'll have to go to that corner of the room over there where there's an actual expert on, on Gaia. Okay, so uh, as many of you probably know or have heard me talking about for years, uh, Gaia is primarily an astrometric mission, meaning it's measuring proper motions and parallax for a huge number of stars in our own galaxy, but also other galaxies, it turns out. Uh, but that's not all. So it also has other instruments on board that will deliver 
um, fairly low resolution spectra for a few hundred million stars, three band photometry for a few billion stars, and radial velocities also for a few hundred million stars. This is what the focal plane of, of Gaia looks like. Well, <laughs> this is a cartoon of what the focal plane looks like, uh, showing the, the instrument layout. So Gaia has two telescopes on the spacecraft. And I'll show you an animation of that in a second. Those two, two telescopes. Those two mirrors both project onto the same focal plane, and this is what the focal plane looks like. As Gaia spins, the, the two uh, images transit this entire uh, focal plane over about 10 seconds. They cover um, these initial CCDs, which actually detect all the sources and tell the onboard software what stars to follow. Then as they, the stars go over this astrometric field, this is also where the G-band magnitude comes from. Gaia follows the little cutout around each star across this field. As it's doing that, it's measuring the precise centroids of the, the locations of those stars. Then it comes off of these, hits the two spectrophotometers, and then some subset also hit the radial velocity spectro, uh, spectrograph there. So here's a movie that I had to cut up, but is still too long, um, showing roughly how, how uh, Gaia scans the sky. So those are the two fields of view. The two telescopes are pointed at about a 105 degree angle between. It looks like it's shooting lasers, but obviously that's actually light coming in. They have to animate how the light goes through the instrument, but basically then hits the focal plane, and this is, this is that layout that I was just showing you before. So this is just the stars from one mirror, and same thing happens for the other mirror, and again, <laughs> they both get superimposed on the same focal plane. And that's critical, because Gaia will be able to deliver a global astrometric solution, and the way they do that is by measuring the relative astrometry between stars that are close on the same field of view, and then they get the global solution from looking at things that are very far away. So they get basically two fields separated by a large angle, which they measure the angle very precisely. That gives them the, the lever to, to get a global astrometric solution. Uh, it, it's, it's implicit in the model. Yeah. But they, there's also the fact that you know the angle. They, have, they do have an interferometer on board, actually. But it's just measuring the angle between the two mirrors. So from seeing slight wobbles in the two fields, you can actually tell from one, one image of a region of the sky to the second time you come back which ones are in which field. It's a crazy, I mean, I could spend an entire colloquium just talking about how they do the astrometric solution. but. Anthony Brown will do that in a couple months. Mention that. Um, so uh, anyway, so as you saw from the previous movie, Gaia is spinning. It's kind of like a top hat that's spinning. And as it's doing that, it's scanning different parts of the sky. This is an animation showing how that's done. So this is the ecliptic plane. This is an ICRS, or equatorial coordinates. Gaia always maintains a 45 degree angle between the spin axis and the sun throughout a year as the, the Earth and the Lagrange point where it's sitting go around the sun. But it processes, it's going to speed up in a second here. There. It starts processing, maintaining that angle, but it processes around the sun. And that's how it, it scans the entire sky throughout one year. So now I'm going to try to pause it. Get the UV adapter. Oh, it's not going to work. Um, Anyway, this is how it builds up this kind of intricate web scan pattern that, that you can see in many of their, their animations. By the way, the color bar is just showing you how many times in a particular region it has hit that part of the sky. So um, this is by end of the nominal mission. Where we're at right now, I wish I could go back. Oh, there we go. Where we're at right now is about here. Ah, <laughs> oh well, I'm fired. Anyway, the point is, in, the, in DR2, there, <laughs> yeah, there's lots of regions of the sky that have only been observed by Gaia about 10 times. There's other regions that have been observed 50 to 100 times. That introduces a lot of systematics in the data. There are regions that have much worse astrometric solutions than others. And so if you're ever looking at the whole sky or the, all the kinematics of all the stars in, in the Gaia um, uh, footprint, you have to keep those in mind. If you see things that look like streams, 
you might actually be looking at the edge of a, the scan pattern. Cool. So DR1 happened in September 2016. That was really just kind of an appetizer. It just had 2 million stars of the, the brightest stars. DR2, which is really the first main release from the Gaia mission, happened earlier this year. Um, so it's been about five and a half months. The next two data releases will be in a couple of years. And I'm actually a little relaxed, a little more relaxed that this number got pushed back a little bit because there's still a lot to do with, with DR2. <laughs> All right, and then this is, again, the Spitzer lectures in April and May will be given by Anthony Brown, who I think is responsible for making a lot of this happen. A lot of the, the decisions about the, the, what will be in the data releases that have ended up benefiting the community a lot uh, where Anthony was in, involved with those decisions. He's the chair of the data processing group for, for Gaia. So what is in uh, a data release, or particularly data release two? So first of all, the data releases happen for the whole world at the same time. There's no proprietary period for which the internal groups can do their own science. They can only do science once the data is public. So that's just a crazy thing that benefits the US enormously, because we're not involved in the data processing. Um, but in DR2, there is astrometry for about 1.3 billion sources, and this is just the mean or the, the instantaneous astrometry at a particular epoch. There's no spectra, but there is uh, three-band photometry, giving, giving us the mean flux or magnitudes of, of the sources, and then radial velocities for just the brightest stars. In the later data releases, we'll have time series for everything. So you'll have 150 uh, light curves for 2 billion sources, 150 light curve points for about 2 billion sources, a bunch of radial velocities for, for a few hundred million, and then the time series astrometry as well. So they're going to fit every source as a binary star system and then deliver the binary star parameters and exoplanet system parameters for all of those sources. Truly crazy. Uh, okay, so I now have to do the impossible task of compressing 250 papers that have come out since April into 20 minutes or so, and just highlight a couple of results. So to start with just uh, the global aspects of the survey, this is the sky as seen by Gaia. This is not an image in the sense that it's not the output of CCDs stitched together into an image. This is made by binning up the density of sources on the sky and then coloring each point by the mean color, BP minus RP color, of the sources in that pixel. So it's like a map of the galaxy reconstructed from the density map of, of the galaxy and the, the color information. No. Everything, yeah. Yeah, so you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds here. There's a number of uh, dwarf galaxies and globular clusters. Dust. Uh, it's a long story, but yeah, I, especially in the plane, yeah. He could answer that in more detail. But. <laughs> Let, let's not go there, because there's a lot. I mean, if we wanted, I could do a separate colloquium on issues with Gaia DR2, <laughs> but we won't do that. Um, just a few toy examples of the type of thing you can do in sort of five minutes using, using the Gaia data. So I just did a query eight degree field around the Pleiades and selected only things that are closer than a few hundred parsecs. This is showing the proper motion distribution. Boom, that's the Pleiades. These are the disk stars. Because I did a distance cut, you don't see, there's no halo population here. If you then select just the stars that look like they're co-moving in, in what we would call the Pleiades, this is the parallax distribution centered at 7.4 milliarc seconds or so, despite what Hipparchus might have told you. Uh, and the interesting thing for nearby things like the Pleiades or other open clusters where you can measure parallaxes is that if you actually deconvolve the error distribution here, you can resolve the internal structure. So you can see the internal kinematics of the stars. You can see line of sight depth of the clusters. It's really outstanding for, for nearby things. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it depends. For the brightest star, the Pleiades in general, the brightest stars are very bright. And so it, it's tens of micro arc seconds per year. Similarly, for the, the parallaxes, it's tens of micro arc seconds for the brightest stars. Uh, so that's for nearby stuff. For more distant stuff, the parallaxes actually don't help you as much measuring the distance to the, those things. But it does help you actually turn off the foreground. 
So you can use the parallax to select only things that have no measured parallax, which is a little counterintuitive. And if you do that, the proper motions are still useful. So for example, this is the same kind of selection done for a field around the globular cluster 47 tuck. Uh, so here I've basically turned off the disk in front of us. So this is the stellar halo distribu velocity distribution in, in proper motion space. Uh, the offset from zero is the solar reflex motion. And then the, um, uh, the globular cluster appears as, as a blob there. So the proper motions are useful out to essentially 100 kiloparsecs or so, whereas the parallaxes are only useful out to about one kiloparsec. The error will be, will be bigger because these are typically fainter stars. So it'll probably be ten, like hundreds of, of um, micro arc seconds, yeah, I think. Uh, a, a little bit smaller. You can actually resolve internal structure in velocity space of globular clusters. Well, 47 tuck, the velocity, I mean, it, first of all, it spans a fairly large angle on the sky, so there's a geometric broadening of the distribution. But also, yeah, I don't know. I didn't do any cut on, on brightness, so there might be a, bun a bunch of faint stars that have much worse uncertainties that are coming in here. Anyway, this was just an illustration of the types of things you can do. And then, uh, just to remind you that there are other instruments on board, here is a Gaia color magnitude diagram for the nearest stars. Again, there's tons of rich structure here. Because we have a larger volume relative to Hipparchus, you can see the binary sequence, giant stars, and then, I mean, just look at the white dwarfs. They're just ridiculous. Like, <laughs> there's a, two sequences here. You can actually trace different compositions of white dwarfs using models. There's been like 10 papers written just on that lower part of the, the diagram, none of which I'll talk about right now. What's the matter? This is all very local to the sun. So the horizontal branch is basically on the giant branch because they're more metal rich. Right, so I, I'm not going to talk about stellar astrophysics or, or um, what you can do with binary stars or anything like that. I'm just going to focus on the dynamics of the Milky Way and, and highlight a couple results. So the first set of results, I would say, that, that came out um, basically demonstrate that if you go to the solar neighborhood and look at the, the velocities of stars, look at the outer disk of the Milky Way, or look at the inner halo of the galaxy, nothing is phase mixed. There's coherent structure everywhere that you can resolve using, using the kinematics in, in Gaia. And of course, that's not really new for the solar neighborhood, at least. We've known that from Hipparchus, which was sort of the precursor to Gaia. If you look at the stars within 100 parsecs or so of the sun, this is the UV plane, but this is basically the velocity going towards the galactic center, so in the x direction, and V is the velocity in, towards the uh, direction of rotation, so in the y direction in, in galactic coordinates. So it's like projecting all of the velocity vectors onto the xy plane, and then just making a 2D histogram of those things. So it's, it's been known for a long time that there's interesting rich structure here. Um, most people you talk about the bimodality here, so, and they call this thing down here the Hercules stream. There seems to be a gap in the velocity distribution. And it's also been long been postulated that this gap is somehow related to the bar in the Milky Way. That that's either related to the co-rotation co resonance or one of the outer Lindblad resonances of a, of a slow bar in the center of the galaxy. So this is an example of doing an n-body simulation where you have a self-gravitating disk and you grow a bar at a certain fixed pattern speed. Um, this is where the four to one outer Lindblad resonance intersects with the velocity distribution in the solar neighborhood and tends to drive stars away into this other region down here. This is that same diagram now made with Gaia data. Doesn't show up as well on there. That's the classic colloquium speaker uh, trick. But anyway, the, the point is that uh, <laughs> there's a lot more rich substructure in the diagram. It's no longer just a bimodality. The velocity precision for these stars, which are all very close to the sun within 100 parsecs or so, is less than a kilometer per second. So any clump you see here is not because of blurring from uncertainties or anything like that. It's either Poisson or it's a real physical structure. Uh, but this is not the coolest part about Gaia. The coolest part about Gaia is that we can do Hipparchus at other parts in the disk. So you can move around the solar area neighborhood. 
do a similar volume and look at how the velocity dis distribution changes. So one idea for what those clumps were in the Hipparchus age was maybe there are moving groups associated with dissolving open clusters and things like that. But if you see, and as you can see here as I move around the solar neighborhood, a lot of these features are coherent throughout the disk. So these have to be resonant features in some sense, and they're too small scale to be driven by the bar. So there has to be something else driving these, these unmixed uh, resonances. This is not a solved problem, but one possible uh, explanation for this is that there's the transient spiral waves that are generated just through the self-gravitation of the disk, which grow and decay. As they grow, they trap stars in particular Lindblad resonances. When, they, when the spiral modes then decay, those stars get stuck in those resonances and then maybe get pushed away by the next generation of spiral arms that form. Yeah, exactly. So another way you can look at it is, as Jeremy suggests, you can just select in velocity space some number of stars and look at the chemical properties. And you find that it looks like just a fair sampling of the disk rather than a single stellar population like you would expect from an open cluster. So this is looking very nearby to the sun. We can also then zoom out and look down. So we're now looking at the spatial distribution of stars in the xy plane. The sun is right at the center, that black dot. And now the, the uh, distribution is colored by bulk motion in the velocities of the stars. So each pixel, and it's smoothed in some crazy way from this paper, uh, each pixel is colored by the mean radial velocity with respect to the galactic center. And I was never a believer in spiral arms in the Milky Way before Gaia, at least in stars, but I have to say that looks a hell of a lot like spiral arms that just happened to be entering this region that the, the survey is, is covering. Uh, so yeah, so this group of stars seems to be bulk moving out. This one seems to be falling back in in a radial sense. So there seems to be interesting spiral structure in the disk. Many of you maybe already knew that. Um, another thing you can look at is the vertical kinematics of stars, again, in a large volume around the sun. So this is the z, so height above and below the galactic plane, vz, the velocity in that same direction. This is the distribution for a smooth disk, an axisymmetric, simple distribution function that's self-consistent. The color here is, uh, is colored by the azimuthal, mean azimuthal velocity in that pixel. So this is a simulation of what you might expect for a smooth axisymmetric disk. That's what it looks like. So there's this really interesting spiral, phase spiral, as it's called. Um, and, and what is this? And is that somehow connected to the bulk motion that we see in the disk? And the answer is, it could be. So this is now a simulation that was not done to predict those plots. This was done for some work that I was involved in. And later on, they just went in and looked at what that simulation would predict. And th this is what they see. So this is a self-gravitating disk that started in equilibrium, where you then put in a dwarf galaxy on an orbit like the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, which has a pericenter. I mean, we've known this for ages, but never really raised red flags. 8 to 12 kiloparsecs. Mean, say again? Right, meaning it's just punching through the disk over and over and over as it's orbiting around. And it's completed several orbits around the galaxy. This is, uh, this is like a natural sort of post-diction, I guess, of, of those simulations that you'd expect to see a um, unmixed spiral in this, the vertical kinematics from the last impact of Sagittarius on the disk that's then phase mixing out as the stars are orbiting around. And also that Sagittarius redistributes the dark matter in the Milky Way halo and causes disk modes to form that can persist for, for quite a long time. So it seems like one plausible explanation for these things is actually the Milky Way is, is being attacked, essentially, by, by the dwarf galaxies. So another, am I getting on time? Okay. Um, another set of interesting results uh, pertains to the halo of the galaxy. So this was all talking about the disk going from the solar neighborhood so moving out, but still thinking about the kinematics of the disk. Uh, the stellar halo, which is farther away and not very precisely defined, um, seems to be, at least according to Gaia, 
uh, dominated by a single ancient radial merger of a fairly massive dwarf galaxy, back when the Milky Way itself might have been called a dwarf galaxy. So th it seems like there was a, s a fairly severe ma major merger early on in Milky Way's history that formed the bulk of the stellar halo within about 30 kiloparsecs or so. And I'm not an expert on this. I'm going to show you a couple plots. Lachlan has actually worked on this, so you can ask him uh, about more detail. So unfortunately, I think the clearest visualization of this thing is, is by the group with the worst name for this thing, uh, which they call it the Gaia Sausage, for reasons I'll show you in a second. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <laughs> anyway, th so there's three groups who have found this independently, and, and this is one of them. Uh, I'm about to show you a bunch of panels that show the galactocentric spherical radial velocity of a star, that's this quantity here, and the azimuthal velocity, galactocentric, of stars. So the disk, for example, would have some small dispersion centered up here at about 220 because it's galactocentric. Then in that direction, you'll see different metallicity populations going from the most metal poor to more metal rich. And from down here to up there, we're going to get closer to the disk. So down here, we're starting at the most metal poor, metallicity less than two-ish, farthest from the disk. So this is what you might think of as the classic accreted halo of the Milky Way. It's a metal poor population with a roughly isotropic velocity distribution. So this is, again, moving up in metallicity. So just focus on the, the bottom panel for a second. So going from minus two, below minus two to still halo-like metallicities between minus one and minus 1.3 or so. But notice the velocity distribution goes from isotropic to something that is more elongated in the radial direction, meaning it's radially anisotropic. Then if we go closer to the disk, start at the top right here, that's the thick disk up in the top right. So that's a, a population that is centered on a different azimuthal velocity and it looks to be colder. But you, start, you see this same radially very anisotropic sausage, <laughs> that's why it's called the sausage, um, uh, persisting in all of those figures. And if you do the, the number accounting of this, it basically, the, the stars that belong to this very radially anisotropic thing account for most of the stuff that's within 30 kiloparsecs or so. So the stellar halo, the inner stellar halo, seems to be predominantly this metal rich for a halo minus 1.5 or so uh, merger that happened a long time ago. Uh, this is using the, this is actually using the Gaia positions and then cross matched with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to measure more precise proper motions for faint stars. Because Gaia, the Gaia proper motions, because they have a very short baseline, are not very good for very, very faint things. So you can actually do better if you use another photometric survey. So they use the region in the, the north part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to re-measure proper motions for faint stars. And uh, I don't think there's a distance cut. Well, they knew about this before DR2, for sure. I could, yeah, maybe. I, I don't remember. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, each, each, set of, each row here is a cut in Z, but I don't think there's a, a cut in the radial direction. So this is also seen by um, Amina Helmi's group, and they named it Gaia Enceladus. So everyone has to have a name for the, the progenitor system. I, personally, I think Enceladus is better than sausage, but anyway. <laughs> uh, they saw this um, in a similar kinematic way. They, looked, they tried to select halo stars, and then they, they cross-matched with the Apogee survey so they could measure alpha abundances and, and metallicity. And what you see is, so this is the sequence that seems to be associated with, with Gaia Enceladus. It seems to be like the thick disk, but somewhat offset in a more metal pore direction. So at any, any given metallicity, because the alpha abundance is lower in, in the Gaia Enceladus progenitor, the star formation rate had to be lower or less intense, uh, which means it was probably a dwarf galaxy. That's, that's the reasoning around on interpreting this diagram. Yeah. So things here typically, in, in this space, the track is uh, things are enriched in iron at fixed alpha, then the type 2s turn on, and then type 1s turn on, and you, you go that way. 
in age. It's right. Intense. Start from the finger. Uh, yeah, although it's a little harder to, I, I think you're thinking of probably globular cluster type okay. abundances. It, of course, these, both the Milky Way and black points and this galaxy had some history of star formation events. So it's a mixture, it's that plus a mixture of many discrete star formation events. Yeah. I think it's hard to age date for sure, but the claim is that it had to be many, like eight giga years ago, 10 giga years ago. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Lachlan, do you know? Well, you're talking about these things. Yeah. I don't know. It, that's a good question for uh, Amina Helmy. Uh, so anyway, the, the point here, though, is that I think the stellar halo, the inner stellar halo, we've gone to thinking it as just like the, a bunch of mergers that all build up together and give us a fairly isotropic distribution to now thinking that it's the inner halo is actually very radially anisotropic and dominated by a single merger event. Uh, and there's other things that I didn't have time and don't have time to talk about uh, that point to the fact that it might actually not be fully phase mixed. So those, if you want to do genes modeling of the halo, for example, to learn about the dark matter halo, uh, that might not work because there's coherent shells out in the, the galactic halo. So we might have to look at particular directions and only do modeling in those, those directions. Anyway, there's a huge literature on this already. I'm sure Lachlan would be happy to talk about it. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. That's right. But I'm, I just mean the, the two met groups of methods. We're going to come back to how you can use unmixed things. But in terms of using phase mixed steady state uh, methods, they will not help you. Cool. So the conclusion of this sort of group of, of results is that the Milky Way is, is, is being strongly perturbed by dwarf galaxies today and was also strongly perturbed in the past. So equilibrium, phase mixing, time independence, these are all things that are broken. Again, we knew about this, but I think one interesting fact is that we can't ever assume that the Milky Way was in equilibrium and was perturbed away from that. It seems like it's been very violent and time dependent for its entire life which many of you who do cosmological simulations would also say, duh. So, uh, so what do we do about that? So back to the solar system example, Hook and Newton didn't have to assume all of these things. And why did they not have to assume all that? Because they see full orbits, exactly. So uh, if you're at the galactic center, or if you're measuring binary star parameters, or looking at the solar system, you have the advantage of resolving time seeing orbits at multiple phases. And that's where uh, stellar streams come in and unmixed things like shells, uh, where I think that they will actually be one of the more powerful ways to go forward with measuring the, the dark matter around the Milky Way. So streams are formed from uh, stellar systems like globular clusters and dwarf galaxies that are just tidally disrupting. I say just, actually, it's fairly hard to get globular clusters to disrupt tidally, but that's a whole other topic. Um, as they're, they're tidally disrupting, stars leak out into form the, these two tails. One starts leading because the energy is lower, comes out Lagrange point one. The other tail is trailing because they have slightly lower energy, or sorry, higher energy, and so they end up um, with, with uh, shorter, or sorry, larger frequencies. I always get the direction wrong there. Um, we know of many of these things around the Milky Way. I was hoping to make a version of this in the Gaia era, but I haven't gotten there yet. So this is, we're still stuck to the SDSS field of streams image. Um, and even worse, the streams are actually painted on or like drawn on with marker. <laughs> so you can only really see Sagittarius, the orphan stream, and PAL-5. The other ones are all just, here's where they are. Um, some of these also probably don't exist. But, but anyway, the point is there are tens of streams in the halo of the Milky Way. And uh, I'll just highlight this very interesting one called GD1, because we'll come back to that. That is the line. That is where GD1 is. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. 
Um, but the, the fundamental assumption here is that streams are not phase mixed. And so we can use that in order to do uh, slightly different modeling. Um, so the reason they're useful is the stream stars that come out are very cold in a dynamical sense. So they very slowly trace out, essentially roughly trace out the orbit of the progenitor system. So it gives you a measurement of the local acceleration field if you can measure the kinematics of the stars along the whole stream. So in principle, once you have the orbits of the streams, you have more information about the acceleration field because you can just compute it from the kinematics of the stars. There's a lot of other details there that I'll, I'll gloss over. Um, but one other very exciting thing, so that pertains to the global structure of dark matter. One other very exciting thing is that the thin streams that form from disrupted globular clusters are very cold. So the velocity dispersion is typically less than a kilometer per second. And so they're very sensitive to perturbations. Meaning if a dark matter subhalo flew by, you would see the imprint of that signature in the density profile of the stream. So in the remaining time, I want to focus on that one stream that you couldn't see before and you can only maybe see in this image. Um, it's called the GD1 stream. It's this set of black points that go across the image like that. This is in its discovery paper in 2006 from SDSS photometry. So this, this image is really just a 2D bin where you weight each pixel by how many stars are metal poor and old in that bin. So this is just using photometry to, to select the stream. I'm going to show you a be much better image in a minute, but the stream is interesting because it's the longest thin stream. Uh, so we now know from Gaia that it's over 100 degrees in length, which means it's old, which means if there was going to be an interaction with a dark matter subhalo, this is a good place to look because it's had a long dynamical evolution in the, around the Milky Way. It has a metal, fairly metal poor old stellar population, so it looks like it's consistent with being a disrupted globular cluster, but it, because it disrupted a long time ago, uh, it's a little confusing that there's other globular clusters that are perfectly happy with similar masses on similar orbits today not disrupting. But again, another topic. Uh, it's relatively nearby for a halo structure, so it's 8 to 10 kiloparsecs, and it's fairly dense over the background because it's basically up away from the disk. So you can fairly easily, even back with just photometry, you can actually start to select out the stars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good question. I mean, there, there's no answer to that. I think one solution here is maybe it wasn't a globular cluster. Another is maybe it, um, it was a globular cluster in a dwarf galaxy, so it was pre-processed in some way on a different orbit and then got dumped onto this orbit and then was fluffy for some reason. But that's exactly the kind of question that I'm troubled by these days. This is what the stream looks like uh, using Gaia. So if you combine a similar type of photometric selection that you could do with SCSS with kinematic selection with Gaia, you can all of a sudden actually see the stream. <laughs> So each point here, this is not binned anymore. Each point is a star that we selected to be in the stream. Yeah. Uh, by just proper motion and using the um, an isochrone filter in the photometry. Most of this is background. So you, because it's so long, you actually hit the disk on either side. So the disk comes in here and the disk comes in here. Uh, but the stuff up here that's off the stream, th that's just halo stars, right. likely. Except for these interesting features, which are statistically significant sets of stars. I, I can show you a plot later to give it to you. But they're sets of stars that are off of the main part of the stream that pass the selection that we did for GD1. There's also these funny underdensities along the stream. So there's this very prominent, what I would call a gap, and, uh, and a slight underdensity there. You can see it a little better in the surface density that I'll show you in a second. The point is that these types of features are not expected from the simple models we have of how the streams form. <laughs> Do you have something to share? <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know where my cursor is. So, 
Oh, you believe that one. Okay. <laughs> All right, then we'll go there. Oh, yes, yeah, for the, the gaps, you're saying, for the under densities. Fine. Feedback. Yeah, okay. So um, this is now basically just zooming in, stretching the y-axis. That's the top panel here. You can select the stars in this polygon, and that's what this blue surface density measurement is here. So these uncertainties should include the Poisson uncertainty. This is a toy model, which is not an n-body simulation, but it's calibrated using n-body simulations, in which the progenitor fully disrupts a few, you know, and basically in the, within the last orbit. And as, once the progenitor dissolves, then the two parts of the stream end up actually mixing away from each other. So one under density you can actually explain just by saying the progenitor fully disrupted and left behind a gap. That's what the shaded region is, yeah, sorry. Uh, the orange is then doing the same thing for the, the model that we have here. So you can reproduce either this, or if you want to say maybe this is the final disrupted part of the progenitor here, then you can say the progenitor disrupted more recently and is, is spread out into that, but then you, you can reproduce this peak and not this dip here or these other variations. So there appears to be interesting density variations along the stream. And those are not expected again for simple models, but they are expected if you look at simulated streams that are, that are generated in live dark matter halos. So as soon as you add substructure, subhalos, they interact with the streams, cause gaps, can, through impulses, perturb stars off of the main part of the track and lead to these spur-like features. So here's just a very toy example of that. This is my stream. It's just an orbit with different points. Showing, looking down on the orbital plane of the stream, and then looking, uh, rotating that by um, 90 degrees. So I'm going to fly a subhalo by. So again, this is a, the coldest possible stream you could have because it's just an orbit. But what happens is you initially form this loop-like thing that then folds back onto the stream, and the stars kind of process back and forth around either end, which cause density enhancements when you actually have velocity dispersion and other internal kinematics. But basically, the physics here is just the impulse approximation. You have a dense perturber flying by, which imparts some delta v on, on the stars in the stream. And that delta v will depend on the properties of the subhalo, the angle of the encounter, the orbit of the stream, et cetera. So one of the things we've been working on is trying to see if you can explain this kind of morphology using an impact with a dark matter substructure. Um, so the, the model that we're using is very simple that we're fitting to the data, which is to take an orbit, perturb it, and then ask, does it produce a gap here and a spur here? So we're not writing down a full description for the density of the stream. We're just asking, does it produce a gap? Does it produce a spur? Nevertheless, if you want to call that a pseudo likelihood, we can explore the parameter space and ask what types of encounter geometries and parameters can produce those two features, and when did those happen? So this is the time of the encounter relative to today, the impact parameter, the velocity of the perturber, the scale radius, and the mass, log mass of the perturber. So just to show you an example of what one of these models looks like, that orange star, if we then take those parameters and rerun with a more realistic simulation, this is the model. This is the data. So it seems like you can produce this type of under density plus spur if you throw a 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 very dense substructure through the stream fairly recently with a vo relative velocity that's sort of consistent with the velocity dispersion of the halo. Yeah, in the likelihood, we're not actually using this model. We're using, again, an orbit with a perturbation. So that produces That's right. Uh, it's, binary, uh, it's binary in that we just ask first, does it have a gap, does it have a spur? We reject if not. 
then we compare the size of the gap and the length of the spur. But in order to define length, you have to decide what's the dense part of the stream, and that's very ad hoc, what we're doing right now. So what we're doing right now is very simple. We're just basically cutting off when the density gets below a threshold, and then asking what's the length of that, that spur. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Next. Uh, there's another hand. Yeah. Oh, even simpler. Here, we're treating the model stream as an orbit. So the stars in the stream are just different phases along the orbit, which is wrong. Fully agree that that's wrong. This is just where we're at right now. You've caught us in the middle of a research project. Ah, yes. So if you, if you take these samples don't mean anything because the likelihood is really ad hoc. But if you pretend that they mean something, then the, um, the mass, typical mass concentration relations for CDM are a factor of 10 less dense than the perturber we need. So then, I don't know, maybe Jenny would throw a supermassive black hole through here or something. Say again. Ah, so you, you want to encounter with another globular cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that is a possibility. We've checked all of the known globular clusters, dwarf galaxies, et cetera. Might even have a. So this is for the orbits of all of the globular clusters. The really tight wiggles are the bulge globular clusters, which never get very close. The other ones are the classical dwarfs, the ultrafaint dwarfs, and the halo globular clusters. This is the um, difference in position between a given um, known object as a function of time going backwards in some fiducial model for the Milky Way. As you vary the Milky Way model, and as you vary within the error, uncertainties of these different models. Yes, some things get within a kiloparsec or so, but of it, the gap. of the gap, yes, sorry. Yeah, sorry, this is the, the delta x between where the, the under density on the stream is as a function of time. Well, it, if it, was very, it has to be very dense in order to produce this thing, so it would be harder to disrupt it. But yes, you can come up with other you can say it's, a, it's just something we haven't found yet, or it's an ultrafaint that we haven't seen yet, for sure. But again, it has to be very, very dense. So anyway, um, the, the models we have, though, make at least when we rerun in a more realistic sense, once we have parameters that we think um, might match the, the type of encounter, we can then predict what the velocity offset will be the kinematics of the, the, like, what the distance offset is for these stars, none of which we can resolve right now, but we're, we've applied for time on tons of telescopes to, to measure radial velocities of the, the main sequence stars. Sorry, that's the model. The main sequence stars up here, uh, and to do very deep imaging using HSC along much of the, the stream to look for more of these density variations. So the story is not, certainly not, not concluded, but, but I think it is a alluring possibility and, and somewhere we should definitely be spending more resources. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot, there's so many details. But so you might notice that the data gets a little clumpy over here. So it, it turns out from about right here over, um, the scan law starts to, uh, the scanning law, Gaia scanning law starts to appear in the selection that we're doing. And that's because as you go this way and as you go this way, you get closer to the disk where crowding is an issue. And here's the detail that no one wanted to know. But Gaia, every, Gaia doesn't record the locations of the stars every time the star hits the focal plane because it can only store a certain number amount of data at any given time. So just in a dense region, just because the star hits the focal plane doesn't mean it's getting a measurement. So in dense regions, the astrometry is even worse in regions where the scan pattern is, is uh, hasn't hit that part of the sky yet. And that's exactly what happens over here. But from essentially minus 50 to the to zero or so, it seems to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't know.
That's right. Simple. Still better than we've done before. But, <laughs> but yes, for sure. Right, right. I mean, yeah, so obviously one thing we're working on is can we come up with the collision rate given n equals 1? And they, yes, we can because we have an, an estimate for the age of the stream, but there's going to be big uncertainties on that. Anyway, um, okay, I'm just about done. So oh, now the clicker's not working. So for streams, I think um, they're a powerful way to constrain both global structure and small scale properties of, of dark matter. Because you can see many phases along an orbit, you don't have to make many of the same assumptions that we make when we're doing genes modeling or, or uh, Schwarzschild modeling. But because, for the very reason that they're good, they're sensitive to time dependent phenomena, it also means we have to include things like the bar of the Milky Way, more than one lump, the evolution of the LMC's orbit, Sagittarius, and that's really, really hard to get all of those things into your model at the same time. On the other hand, the payoff could be very large. We want to constrain dark matter on the smallest scales. If this is a way to do it, if this is our only way to do it, aside from through strong lensing, we better invest some time in that. So the, the final thoughts I would say are that no components of the Milky Way are steady state time independent systems, so we have to face up to that. Um, and, and so the era of strong equilibrium assumptions, I think, is in decline. It's not dead. They're still, they still teach us things. Um, but it does, it, there, there's no theory. If you look at Binion and Tremaine, there's one slight part of one chapter that discusses what happens when all of their assumptions break down. There's no theory that tells us what we can learn from collections of unfazed mix, time-dependent, possibly chaotic stellar orbits. And so that's, I think, the challenge for the next five to 10 years if we actually want to use the Gaia data to, to do these kinds of inferences. So don't recycle your copy of Binion Tremaine. That's all. <laughs>